All right, so I'm here with the uh, the Avastar Elite, and uh, the build is pretty much done. Uh, I've still got to iron out some of the bubbles uh, with my heat gun, and uh, I need to balance the airplane. So to balance it, we'll pick it up from the front and the back, and then my method, what I do is I put change on whichever wing is dropping. They, they, they're never perfectly balanced, so you pick them up and we'll say the left wing is dropping. I'll, I'll pick it up three times, the left wing will drop all three times. What I'll do is I'll put a quarter on the right wing and I'll work my way up. So like the last plane that I built uh, was a little bit larger than this. Um, I was, it took three quarters and a nickel. Then I just threw them on a scale. They came out to, I think it was 0.65 ounces. And what I did was I made a very small incision on the underside of the wing and I injected a glue bottle and I put 0.65 ounces of glue in the end of the wing. And then I just taped over that small incision. You can't even see it. And that's how I balanced the airplane out. But I know people have different methods. But anyways, uh, obviously went with an electric build with the airplane. Uh, it's most typically built gas, I think. Uh, the example that Great Plains uses is gas. Um, I did encounter a couple little hiccups, we'll say, in the, in the build directions because they were more oriented towards gas. And I even had to modify one part to get it to work with the electric. But we'll go through it. So first thing was that uh, they recommended the 0.46 rim fire and uh, it seems like a great motor seems like a quality motor uh, got that got it into the airplane uh, it, with this kit you're going to have to do servos speed control motor and receiver none of those things come with the kit so uh, the first thing was the motor and i picked that up um, now they recommend their Great Plains Silver Series electronic speed control, which, uh, where is that? Yeah, right here, is um, 45 amps. So I kind of ordered something to give myself a little more variability with batteries, and I went with this. I went with a 60 amp speed control. Uh, unfortunately, the problem was that the connectors on this were too small. Now, I mean, obviously, I could have changed the connectors out. The rim fire did come with other connectors. So I could have cut these connectors off and then put different connectors on here. What was interesting was that I had this Castle 90 laying around and the wires matched right up with the Castle 90 for that motor. Um, but what I wound up doing was, you know, and here's how the plane Kind of comes apart what i wound up doing was i had an 80 amp uh skywalker hobby wing skywalker speed control that mounted right up and fit right together with the wires i just got to push them inside the the hole that comes there um, i left them hanging out and sure enough when i powered it up it was reversed it was spinning backwards so of course that problem is solved just by reversing two of the wires um, so I reversed two of the wires and now it's spinning in the appropriate direction. Uh, so that was the setup that I went with, uh, the hobby wing Skywalker 80 amp. Now I can run that a four S battery on that. I believe it says that it's good for two S to six S. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, it'll be interesting to see in the future how the flights pl uh, play out the recommended battery for this aircraft is a 3200 well here's a 35 um this is a 3500 4s so this is pretty much the recommended battery the recommended battery is a 3200 so this is pretty close uh so this would be a step up this is a 3700 and then this is a 5000 milliamp uh 4s I think this is going to be the battery right here. I think this is going to give us like 12 to 14 minutes of flight time. I think this is going to be the battery we really want to go with. Now, I don't fly like a lot of crazy 3D stuff, and that's where this battery might kind of hurt you. Um, you might have a problem getting this thing to stand on the prop with this battery in there because it is only 4S and it weighs a lot. But for my style of flying, which is pretty much pattern flying, 
I think this battery is going to be the winner. Uh, but this is the recommended rate, well, close to the recommended, and this would be one small step up. Now, this is going to have the capability to run like a 6S because of the 80 amp speed control. I don't know how the 4.6 will hold up to that. I'll have to do some research into it, see if that motor will handle a 6S, but I think it will. I'll have to read into that a little bit. But let's take a look at the airplane and the build and just talk about some of the things that uh, came up during it. We'll just go uh, in order here. So first we had the installation of the servos in the wing. All right, so this is how the wing attaches. You have two nylon bolts that go through in the back. Uh, and then there is, you can see this slot in the front and the wings have this slot. Now, I don't, uh, I like it. I don't, I don't hate it. But uh, if anything, this seems just a slight bit vulnerable to me. I'm going to epoxy coat these pieces of wood, obviously separately, don't glue them together because then the wing won't come apart. But uh, this seems like a little bit of a vulnerability to the kit, um, as opposed to having the studs on the body and using rubber bands. And then if you hit a post or something, get a little wing damage, you can fix it and then switch out the rubber bands. These guys here are gonna break. But of course, I mean, in the event that that happened, you could always probably just, you know, glue in another piece right here so uh, but that is how the wing attaches you've got these pieces of wood in the front they go in a slot come down and then they have these nylon screws in the back now the kit comes with uh this shrink tube here and what this is for is so like this servo lead is going to come out it's only going to make it to about here so you need this piece of shrink tube so what you do is you put an extension on there and then you cover the extension with the shrink tube and shrink it down i had shrink tube here in a kit and i just used my own i didn't realize that there was some provided in the, in the hardware package for the airplane now uh these were installing them was seamless uh there was a piece of string pre-installed in the wing actually the string wrapped around a spar back here and came back out so there was actually two separate pieces of string it's not actually tied to these spars it's just taped so you can reach in with a pair of pliers and just pull it off pull it out tie that string on the lead and pull it through the wing uh you could fish it through there it would just be a bit of a pain because all these spars are running through and it's just going to take you longer and you're going to be manhandling the wing and you don't want to do that grab that little piece of string out of there tie it to the end of the lead this one have the extension on and just easily pull it through very easily it'll come out the end of the wing you know and then just feed it up through this hole because this is where it's going to need to go when it's put together now the one build thing I don't have yet that's coming, I'll try to clip in a picture, is uh, a connector where all four of these will connect to one side and then they will clip one connector and then all four of those leads will plug into my receiver. But again, that's the way I wired this thing up. You, because I'm running an eight channel receiver, all of these will have their own channels. Now, when this kit comes, the flaps are pinned through. There's a little pin through right here. So another thing you're gonna have to do is cut that pin if you wanna run flaps. Now, as most of us are well aware, you probably don't really need flaps. If there's any kind of wind, you absolutely don't need flaps. But in a zero wind condition, and if I'm going to build the thing, these are here. Uh, these flap holes are not cut. They're not pre-cut. You can see my cut job there. Not the best ever. So you're going to need an X-Acto knife, and you have to cut out the coating to, to get these flap servos in. Obviously, some people are going to build it without flap servos. That will certainly spill the, speed up the build time. Um, I, I, was go I wanted to go the full distance full function i put four servos in the wing i did flaps so the other thing just to be aware so this is the gas rod which obviously i won't need because i don't have a throttle because i didn't do gas motor um, this kit is going to be all these metal rods and they're going to be threaded on one end so you screw them into a connector connect the connector to the control surface set it down and then mark with a felt tip marker where you want the bend to be and then bend it and then clip these arms on here so this is something that you're going to have to do with your control arms which the way this model is set up 
your servos are all located in the middle of the model, so they all have control arms going back to the control surfaces. Opposed to a lot of models today that are coming with like servos back here, and it's got a pre-cut control arm on it, this is a nice smooth airplane and keeps all of your servos located in the center of the model. So uh, a little bit different than what we're seeing. I think a lot of older kits were situated this way. Seems to be a little more of a gas thing to situate the kits this way. Um, but I guess it's just a preference of the builder. Uh, you can put the servos in the middle and run a control arm, or you can run a servo extension back and have a servo hanging out right here. Um, nonetheless, what you need to be aware of is that you're going to have to bend these rods. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them for electric and then one more for gas. Luckily, because when I was doing my first electric rod, I broke it. Um, you want to do this with intention uh, because if you have to re-bend this, it's probably going to break. And that's what happened with this one. Uh, but I'll just continue to go in order. So this was... You know, I got the servos installed, uh, I got the rods, I did not connect the rods, I waited uh, until we connected the servos to the receiver so that I could center them. So at that point the, reservo, the receiver wasn't even in the aircraft. I just plugged it in and separately and zeroed the servos and then I bent the rods so opposed to a lot of other kits you're seeing this one is going to be a, a little bit more work um, it's funny because one ARF kit is like literally four screws to put the wing on and, and it's ready to fly and this is also labeled an ARF kit I'd say on a scale of one to ten for ARF kits this is probably going to be a little bit more work um, of course I think the end product is you know a lot better than you know, a lot of other kits, this obviously balsa and coating um, and what you're going to wind up with in the end. These control arms are not two millimeter. I believe they're like 2.4. So they're a little heavier. Uh, all of these connectors, while they are plastic-ish, I believe they're actually nylon. And uh, they go right through the control surfaces. Actually, these ones don't. The other ones on the tail do. Um... So they're, they're actually nylon, and I would say these are good. i got to go back and put the rubber caps on these because it doesn't look like they're on there. Um, but, but I will go back and do that. So that was the wing. That's going to be the first step in the directions. First thing it's got you doing, here you go, is installing these uh, servos, bending the rods. So I used these pair of pliers to bend these rods. Uh, the other thing that you should be aware of, and, and this is where like the time starts to mount up with this kit. Uh, we've got our control arms. So these are the servo horns. This, these metal rods don't fit through these servo horns. Now at first what I was doing was taking a piece of it and just kind of, I filed off the corner so it was like a pick and then putting the tip in there. And what I would do is hold it in the pliers, heat it up with... Uh, a flame and then push it through. I wound up using this pick here. So this wound up being a really good tool to use. I would just hold it like that, put a little heat on the pick. This would all get kind of blackened. And then I would expand these holes a little bit in the front, a little bit in the back. And I like that method opposed to say taking an X-Acto knife and hollowing them out because if you're hollowing them out, you're removing the plastic. Okay, so you're weakening the, the horn. If you're heating this element up and pushing it through, you're expanding the arm so you're not taking anything away from it. And it's already thin material to begin with. So I would encourage you to do it this way. And put it in here, heat it up a little bit, push that through wide enough so that this fits through here because it will not fit. Uh, and, it is, and another thing with servo fitment, uh, if you're going to go with, uh, spectrum as I did none of the servo leads are going to plug directly into uh, this well this is a spectrum plug here so the Futaba ones have a little fin on the side which I found out you can just clip off with a sm small pair of pliers that fin is is fairly easy and then take an exacto knife and shave the corners of the uh, of the rectangular 
the uh, Futaba servos have a completely rectangular plug where and a fin on the side so you got to cut the fin off and then you take the knife and and uh, grind down these corners so that they're it's not a rectangle anymore it'll fit um, so just all these little things that you're not necessarily expecting to be doing that uh, make this uh, ARF kit start taking some a little bit more time than you may have expected but uh, it's nothing epic I didn't think that any of it was difficult um, bending the rods do it like I said do that with intention don't mess around there and do it one time do it correctly um, so this is the picture here I was talking about this servo is cut in already the hole is there to go in for your aileron but if you're going to do the flaps then you have to cut out that little nylon spar that goes through there uh, which I used <laughs> I used a steak knife um, but some sort of uh, saw but you're going to have to you know it's got to go up into this very thin channel and then cut that nylon peg that goes through there. And then take your X-Acto knife and cut out the slot and then put it in. Driving the screws in was no issue at all. Again, this pick was a nice thing to have. You know, you just put it through the servo holes, pick, pick, you know, and then drive the screws in. That was easy. Uh, so we'll keep moving here. The uh, control surface arms are already connected, so that's not something that you have to do. Uh, it has the removable windshield, which is nice. Uh, what I would call a typically electric feature. Uh, classic gas, you have the gas tank comes in under the wing root and installs in the front, and this doesn't come off. But for electric models, these all come off. So this is sort of an electric-ish feature to the build. Um, now here's where it gives you some gas instructions and then you step over and it gives you the electric instructions. Uh, and so now we'll talk about this motor mount. Uh, they provide you with this motor mount. Uh, it's not a bad motor mount, uh, but it's not the greatest. Uh, the problem with it is that it's kind of thin and, and that stood out to me. And then uh, my buddy who's been building airplanes for a long time, you know, we're looking over the kit when we unboxed it. And he, you know, he said the same exact thing that I said. This is a little bit thin. So now that it's all installed, I'm going to go back and take a piece of balsa wood and cut out sections that fit in there and epoxy them in just to reinforce this motor mount. Okay. But uh, these are blind nuts. Uh, so you, you drill a hole through. These are pre-installed. To install the motor mount, this is what I guess we call the firewall for the, for the gas motor, which is pre-doped. You can tell this is sealed for gas. Uh, this inside area, all this balsa has been sealed for gas. Um, but I, it's not gas, but you can tell it's pre-sealed. Um, it's pre-drilled for, uh, for this motor mount. Um, you want to use your spacer so there's a spacer here and then there's a locking washer there and then on the back is like a blind nut this is a 632nd screw by three quarters in length four of those hold on the motor mount um, nothing epic going on there super simple there is these holes are pre-drilled so you can get your screwdriver through here and tighten these screws up uh, and that's what gets your motor mount onto your firewall and, and again you've got these blind nuts in the back that are pre-glued uh, around here so that's how the motor mount goes on uh, nothing epic there now this was in an addendum that came on a separate page from the instructions in the manual you've got these lines that tell you where to line up your motor mount so this motor mount this x brace i believe they call it comes with the rim fire you set it on the motor mount and mark where these holes are and then you drill these holes through this motor mount to accommodate this X brace that comes with the rim fire. Uh, the only issue I ran into there, well, not issue, but um, I used this Dremel uh, glass and tile bit uh, to drill these holes and it worked out beautifully. I mean, this I didn't actually use a drill bit on this. I used this glass and tile bit perfect size so i'm not sure what size would have been the recommended one uh, i use this glass and tile bit right here so but this takes us to the back so now again these blind nuts right here are provided in the kit that's part of the hardware kit 
this is where I encountered my first kind of problem. You can see here, this piece of wood used to come straight to the firewall. There wasn't enough room for this blind nut to get down in there and settle against this wall of the motor mount. So I had to take my Dremel, again, with that glass and tile bit, this was quick and easy, Dremel out this piece of wood here. And you can imagine, we already didn't like how kind of thin this thing was. Now I'm Dremeling pieces of it out in order to fit this blind nut into the setup. But nevertheless, I mean, there's no way to do it. If you don't drill this out, how do you possibly get this down in there? You can't, it's impossible. So I had to clear out this area right here. You can see I just did as little as I possibly could. I mean, it was literally scraping against this as it was coming, seating down against this uh, plate on the motor mount. So you're going to have to modify this. You're gonna have to drill this out here. I highly recommend this glass and tile bit. Uh, this is quick and easy, carves it right out. I would not use a sheetrock bit because it doesn't work fast enough and you get too much heat buildup. The glass and tile bit just shredded this quickly and easily and I didn't get any bouncing around or anything. Um, so that allowed me to modify this to fit these blind nuts in with this motor mount. Now, I think the issue there was if you had a larger motor, these would be further out. Now, I, I balanced it top and bottom, left and right, so I couldn't go any further out. This is the recommended motor for the kit. Those blind nuts 100% will not go in with this firewall not being modified. You, you've got to cut it out. Now, if you go with a larger motor and you can go further out these lines, then this would fit in there. But again, this is the recommended motor. The 80 motor probably wouldn't need this cut here, but you're going to need to cut that if you're going to go with the 4.6. Not a big deal, but something you're definitely going to have to do. And this is a great tool for it. Trusty Dremel. So uh, that gets these screws in here. Um, of course, uh, metal on metal on metal on metal, Loctite, all of this stuff. And again, this is where this all starts to add up in time, where you're Loctiting all these screws one by one, and you are cutting these firewall sections. There's four of them you're going to need to cut back to get these blind nuts in there. Uh, so all these things start eating up time. So uh, now this, I used uh, the other thread locker. When I did the motor mount to the motor, I used the permanent thread locker on that. So for these, I use the blue thread locker in case I have to tighten it later. But this one, I use the other permanent thread locker, X brace to motor mount, permanent thread locker. And then you need to put this other metal piece on the front of the motor. And again, I used the permanent uh, thread locker to do that as well So that is permanently on there uh, Nothing really going on with this uh, spinner. It was pretty straightforward uh, These screws actually I have to say are just a little tiny bit of a pain. They're very narrow screw holes um, so you can't fit you know like a a bitted tool into that hole and then you can't fit any larger of a screwdriver These are actually just slightly a pain, but um I made the screwdriver I have work, but there is a size that would have been better that I didn't have on hand. Uh, they recommend a 12 inch prop. This is a 12 inch prop. At first it seemed a little bit small to me, but if you stand it up and you look at the front wheel, you really can't go any bigger or you'd be hitting the ground. So there's there's that there. So that's all what's involved with the motor mount and the motor. I, this, this took me some time and a run to Home Depot and um, you know, if you're ready to cut these out, you know, and you that that should save you some time right there. Some things that you're going to have to do. So let's keep moving. Uh, they wanted you to glue the speed control up to the side of the. I, I didn't want to do that, so I I uh, velcroed it to that bottom compartment there. I hope that'll be all right. Um, they got a battery in there. I added this velcro strap and I put this velcro down on the bottom. Uh, putting the landing gear together was nothing epic. I feel like it's a high quality landing gear. Again, it's the one where you're 
your axle is separate from your landing gear itself and then this locking bolt goes on the back and then you've got I don't know what the nomenclature is on these pieces but just don't forget you're gonna need Loctite on that one and you're gonna need Loctite on this one this one is a locking nut so you don't really need it um, but high quality stuff uh, I like the landing gear a lot the way this landing gear works, you push like a button that's up in there and it releases this wheel and you can just slide it out. You can't see it anymore because it's under the servos, but this landing gear will actually just pop right off. It's pretty neat. Here, I got the button pushed now. I don't think I'm pushing it far enough. Oh, maybe it's the other one. I haven't done this yet push this back in yeah there we go push it back in push that up there it goes and the landing gear pops right off so kind of neat kind of unique I haven't seen that on another so again you got these holes up in the bottom of the model and you just push this in and it just clips in and then to get it off you just push that release up in there and and the landing gear pops right off and so that's the main landing gear, uh, the nose landing gear. Okay, so this was a little bit of an issue. Um, let's take a look at this real quick. So the nose landing gear, the way it's designed, you see it goes up, the straight rod goes up here. On the gas model, that pin goes right up into the aluminum gas mount which is good. I mean, that's going to give it some bracing and some reinforcement, which is good, opposed to just the steering wheel mount. Um, this, uh, this piece right here, this pin goes right up into the gas mount, right? So let me just grab this. This pin right here extends up above, goes into the gas mount. It's too long on the wood motor mount. Now, again, this is already installed when you get to this step. That pin is about a centimeter and a half up. Eats right into the electric motor frame. So my solution was to cut it. I'll, I'll crop in some pictures, but uh, I certainly didn't want to cut this motor mount down any. And I figured even if I did cut this motor mount down some more, it wasn't going to offer any reinforcement to this wheel with this light wood here. So my solution was to cut off uh, the steering wheel uh, post right there. Uh, and, and then you just uh, clamp on this control arm and you've got a metal rod that comes out and bends down and goes through the control arm. Now again, this control arm, just like all the control arms on the servos, that rod does not fit through that control arm. So you're gonna have to take this item here so you can see as I put it up into one of the holes, other holes that's already there, it doesn't go very far up in there, you see that? So you apply a little heat to this and you can work it up in and expand that hole and that's what you're gonna need to do to get that to fit through. So not a big deal, just some extra work and like this is a kit piece and this is a kit piece. I kind of feel like they should have fit together, but it's not a big deal. Put a pick in there, heat it up, expand that hole a little bit. Don't drill it out. Uh, retain all of your all of the material for for strength. So that's the nose wheel and the main landing gear, uh, and then you've got your servos, four servos here. Again, I did something different here. Let's just take a look so it had the rudder servo right here the way this worked in the book was the rudder servo controlled the rudder from one arm on one side and then on the other arm controlled the steering and then this was elevator and uh, this was the gas engine uh, controller and, and that's the way the directions read in the book but without a gas engine you know so when i purchased it they said well you don't need the sixth servo well it didn't make any sense to me to not have a servo in here i don't know i just didn't want to do it that way so i changed things up this is now the elevator this is now the rudder 
and this is now a separate controller for the nose wheel, which will be on its own channel of the receiver. So if I need to tune the nose wheel, but my rudder is perfect, it's on its own channel now on the receiver down in there. So I don't have to make a mechanical adjustment, which uh, making a mechanical adjustment might be a little bit of a pain. So just be careful with this. These come in the kit and, the, and I don't know what the nomenclature is, but they attach to these uh, wires. I like this piece a lot. This is a really neat piece. It works really well. There's a little, little, little tiny piece of plastic that goes on the back that clips onto it. It's like literally uh, like smaller than a, a bead that just clips on there. I misplaced it. So <laughs> I got one of these sitting around that doesn't have a bead lock for the back of it. So I used this metal clevis that I had sitting around. I just screwed it onto the threaded arm and put it on the servo. The only thing that's tough about this is this is really hard to turn. It's really hard to adjust. Um, and now it leads to a bent rod. So adjusting this would be really difficult, but it's its own steering servo. So we can adjust it, you know, well, now I, I plugged it into the receiver before I put the horn on and I've used it and it seems to work fine. So that's how I set up the servos. It's not how the book had them set up. If you're going to do the electric model, see, they got rudder elevator throttle. Let us see. You're not going to need throttle and they don't go back and give you separate directions for gas and electric on servos, which they probably should have because you're not going to use those same servos for the same things. I see they never come back to it. They never give you electric directions on the servos. So uh, again, if you're going to do electric, I would recommend with these servos, you do nose wheel elevator rudder, whichever it is. You'll, you'll see it. It's the tubes that match up. Now let's just talk about these metal wires really quick. Uh, the way that I wound up doing these, uh, that I would recommend it is, so what I did was, yeah, I got that tilted down. What I did was I put them in from the back and I put them up to the control arm. I put them up to the servo and what I did was I held, oh, there, of course it's on the other side. Flip it around. I held this plastic piece right here, right in line. I didn't screw it onto there. I just held it right up to this point on the threads. I wanted the threads to go at least this far in, right? And this is why I did it this way. I didn't want them like three thread, three turns in. I guess that would be probably like an industry standard minimum. I wanted it to be like up to here. So I inserted the rod from the back and I clipped this plastic piece on and I, set the rod to be right there. Then I went in here with the servo horn attached. I took my black marker and I just marked where I would want the bend to be. Uh, and then I just slid the rod back out, took the pliers, bent the rod. Now what's nice is with the removable front, now you can reinsert the rod from the front because it's got a bend where the servo is into the tube that's in there, get it in line, and then connect your plastic piece, and then screw this on. So that's how I wound up doing these metal rods. Um, and then when I got it back here, so that I wasn't screwing the servo up front, just hold on to this and, and twist it on. And that's how I did these. Now another little thing that I encountered was, you can see these holes here. This control arm for the rudder should have been on the left side, right? Because that's where, that's where the control arm comes out of the model. Should have been on the left side. It was factory installed on the right side, right? So not like, not a big deal. But what I needed to do was remove it from, from the right side and then pre-drill the two holes, put it in place, mark it, mark it, or just, I took this and poked, okay, and then ran those screws back through to move the control arm from this side where it should have been over to this side. 
And again, you can see there's still some, you know, bubbles in this. I still need to heat uh, some of these elements to get this stuff tight. But that was pretty much it. Uh, you can see they've got these panels on the back side of the control surfaces because these are thinner control surfaces. Um, you know, this side's got the control arm. This side's got the backer panel. On the wing, the control surfaces are so thick, the screws don't reach the backer panel. That's why they don't have them on the wing. But they have them here and here. So I had to move this from here to here. Uh, not a big deal, but something I encountered and you may have to do. Uh, nothing epic. Like I said, just unscrew it, slide this over to here, poke the two holes, pre-drill them, you know, and, and then install it. Uh, you've got two screws hold on the tail, basically. This nylon screw and this nylon screw go into the horizontal or the vertical stabilizer, and that just automatically holds on the horizontal stabilizer and I was curious as to how that would all feel and, and go and all that it's fine it's it's really tight uh, it's good to go um, so that's it I mean that was uh, that's the whole model assembly uh, if you're doing electric you're, you're not going to be using uh, the on off switch um, obviously if people are, are folks that are doing gas uh, you're going to have a separate battery that powers your servos probably for the day because it's usually installed down in the model. So they're going to want to turn off their servos as soon as the thing lands after a flight. Maybe put some more gas in it, turn the servos back on. Uh, I'll probably just cover this up with a black sticker. I haven't put any stickers on it yet. Um, and that's it. Uh, I can't wait to get the thing up in the air and get it flying. Uh, I love this front door hatch assembly. It's got these uh, two larger plastic posts here that slide into these holes. Um, I think the fit and finish of, of everything. I don't know if I would really call this an ARF. I, I, I don't think that ARF is really the acronym that fits most accurately for this airplane. I would call this like a, a pre-built. <laughs> it's really a pre-built airframe. And then they give you the recommended electronics and then you have to install everything. Uh, but everything is installed. Uh, I have ran it all up. Everything seems to be pretty much ready to fly. Uh, I've got to get that connector in, which is just that harness is just a convenience. It's not really a necessity. Uh, and I've got to balance it, and it should be ready to fly. So there it is, the Great Plains Avastar. All right, so just putting the finishing touches on this airplane here, one of the issues, uh, one of the things I had to do, um, I got the single connector, uh, four, four servo single connector hooked up inside, uh, and when I did that, so when we put these servos in, we estimated where the middle was. Uh, and you can take a look here now. Here's our flap, and you can see this, sur this, this control surface is just a little high. Now, I could trim that out, but I really don't want to because then I'm going to lose some uh, control travel. So I'm just going to remove this screw from the top of this servo and pop this arm off and go to the next all right so in this case we can't mechanically trim it out because that's as close as we can get so what i'm going to do is drop that back down we're not going to use a servo adjustment what i probably should have thought of before adjusting the servo so if we can't use a servo adjustment then i'm going to use this connector uh, to make the adjustment and we want this to come all right well, let's just take a quick look at it again so right now it's here it's just above the surface we want to push it out just a little bit i'm going to give it one turn out there's half a turn and i think one more turn is going to be the answer up oh, there we go and now it is I'll give it half a turn more. 
And there we go. Now it is perfectly, perfectly flush. Push it together. And now these control surfaces are perfectly flush. Unfortunately, when we hit our flap button here, we'll see our flap will come up over here, but not over here. Uh, our flap servo is not working on the left side. Um, I've taken a look at it and I put another servo in this plug and it runs full up and full down. So I think this servo is actually not working. But uh, I'll come back when I can get that uh, more properly figured out. But our ailerons are up and running. I can't really set this one perfectly yet because, well, actually this flap, we can set that one. This flap is even with this control surface. Let's just take a look over here. You can see this needs to come in. So what we're going to do is pop this off, pop this up, and probably run it in. That looks like, oh. This has already been screwed pretty far in. So I'll tell you what, we're gonna use a ser we're gonna we're gonna use a servo for this because this is so far off. We're just gonna pop this off here and move this in a servo notch. Now it's whenever these things never seem to be perfectly centered. It's either one below or one above. And sure enough, when you put it there, look at that. That control surface is straight on perfectly. All right. So now we've got that perfect. So the only issue I'm left with now is that this other servo over here, I believe is not good. So I'll take a closer look at that and get back. GoPro, stop recording. All right, so the Avastar is uh, pretty much ready for its first test flight. Uh, pretty much got everything done last night. Uh, I got the wing, the airplane balanced. Uh, it took, I believe it was two quarters and a nick, uh, nickel worth of glue uh, in the right wing to get the airplane to balance out. Uh, it was like 0.5 ounces. Uh, I've got the radio set up. Let's take a look at the flight controls. <sighs> so I've got the flaps and takeoff flaps. Flaps up. Now, so there's flaps up. I've got everything mechanically set. So Everything is zeroed on the remote as far as trim. There is no trim entered. Uh, and I've used our plastic tabs, our plastic clevises to make these mechanical adjustments match the, uh, I match the flap to the wing and then uh, the aileron to the flap. So all mechanical there. I uh, did some flap settings uh so there's flaps 50 percent 50 percent was not a vocal command so unfortunately i had to settle for takeoff flaps landing and then landing flaps are 100 percent i mean i'd rather have flaps 50 and flaps 100 but takeoff flaps they, those were not uh options uh here's our ailerons all set up so i hit to the left my left should rise hit to the right my right should rise and of course they should move opposite of each other um, I have dual rates set up. So my remote philosophy is when I'm on approach, um, I can flip. Mid rates. Uh, I'm right handed. So this is the easiest switch on the remote for me to flip is this switch right here. So when I'm on approach, I want to be able to keep my hands as much as possible on the sticks. So therefore, this is the easiest thing. I, I tend to even hold my finger right here. So to make a flap adjustment, all I have to do is just blink take this finger flaps. up, right? And take off flaps. Um, and then if I wanna go full landing flaps, blink that finger one more up. I can keep my hands on the controls easily. I don't have to move them off. 
and the finger I'm flipping the switch with in the hand is my right hand. I'm right-handed. It's my predominant hand. Unfortunately, I broke these off doing this, uh, setting all the stuff up yesterday, but I wasn't going to use them anyways. So there's flaps at 100%, which is calling uh, landing flaps. Take off flaps. Take off flaps is 50%. And then flaps up is flaps fully up. Uh, on the other side, I set up dual rates. I made this my rate switch, okay? So to me, this is my second easiest switch on the remote to get with, left index finger. So this is my rate switch for all three of my, uh, my rudder, my elevator, and my aileron. Mid rates, low rates. All right, so... Basically, and I've got dual rates set up. So low rates are for low speed. Mid rates are for medium speed. Low rates are for high speed. Obviously, you're running the aircraft full out, full power. You reduce your travel. Uh, you're going to keep the aircraft response to your control inputs somewhere near the same. Whereas if you're just always in high rates as the aircraft speeds up it becomes more sensitive to your stick adjustments um so we'll take a look so like look there's elevator with the high rates that's how much they move mid rates, mid -rates is less low rates. low rates is the least amount of movement so see how little they move at low rates mid rates, mid -rates for medium speed Low rates is about 80% of travel. Now, I also um, set this up for initial pattern flying and flight. So let's just take a look at how I set the remote up real quick. Um, dual rates and expos. So again, what you're going to have to do is go down to switch and just throw that switch High to assign it. High rate. Um, ailerons is where I have the biggest adjustment. Ailerons and elevator is what I feel like uh, there's the greatest variances. I like rudder to be pretty much left alone. And uh, elevator, um, I, I can deal with elevator, but aileron is where it's really good to have some different rates. So because it's the first time I'm taking the aircraft out, I'm only gonna move the control surfaces 90%. I also assessed that with these control surfaces versus this wing, I mean, I have aircrafts with smaller wings and larger controller surfaces. So these control surfaces are not to designed for like 3D to begin with. They're relatively small compared to the size of the ring, the wing. It's obviously set up to be a trainer. So with that in mind, I only limited it to 90% on the aileron. And if you take a look, it doesn't even reach the top of the flight surface. So now on other aircraft that I have, 90% it would be above the control surface because the the ailerons are larger ailerons. But with this aircraft, relatively small ailerons compared to the wing, rather large uh, curve to the wing. So uh, I was comfortable leaving them at 90% for the initial flight. Uh, go switch down to mid rates. We're gonna limit them to 70%, but where we also go up a lot is our expo. We move our expo up to 40%. And this is where having a rate switch is really helpful. It's actually not so much that the travel, I think, makes a huge difference. It does make a difference if you make a radical change. The travel does make a difference. But the expo is what really makes a difference. High rate. Your high rate is 30% of expo. That's when you're going slow. Mid when you move to medium speed, if you go to mid rates, you get 40%. And when we go to high rates, high it's going to limit your travel to 50% and your expo is gonna be way up on 60 because these control surfaces now have a lot more influence when the airplane is flying faster. So these are pretty conservative rates. I may wind up bringing these up after, um, but for initial setup, this is how I've got it set up. I've, right. I've got these rates set up on this switch. Now to get the rates, you just have one set of rates when you go into here, but then you go down to switch and you can either select it or just flip it. So I flip it to get switch B and now I've got switch B selected. Then the other thing you're gonna have to do is go down to custom voice setup. So click that. And so we've got custom voice setup set up for G, B and H. So uh, H, I'm sorry, G is our flaps over here. Take off flaps. 
Flaps up. B is uh, our, our rate switch. Mid rate, high rate. And then H back here is our hold. Normal mode. Normal could have been a lot of different things. I really would have preferred, I don't know, maybe something different. But if you flip it up. Hold mode. It says hold mode. That's what's important. That's what you want to hear. Um, I really utilize hold mode and I would highly, highly encourage you if there's anything about the radio setup, use hold mode, set up hold mode. Even if you don't attach the vocals to it, um, set up hold mode. I actually know somebody who was uh, seriously injured and had many stitches in their leg because especially an electric model, so gas, if it hits you say in the leg, it tends to stop electrics they're going to power to 80 amps or whatever the maximum amperage is and uh i know a gentleman has pretty severe injury in his right leg from calf muscle from that so uh please if there's anything that you listen to set up hold mode hold mode do yourself a favor and, and attach the voice to it so that you know when you flip it normal mode hold mode you've got hold mode that you didn't flip take off flaps takeoff flaps, flaps and out. thinking you're in hold mode and then you reach down to pick the airplane up bump your throttle switch and the next thing you know you're in the hospital so if there's anything about the setup i mean please do this uh, hold mode and attach the vocals to it and if you're going to use this switch attach vocals to this switch too because if you're flying and you go to flip your dual rates and let's just say you accidentally flip this it's gonna shut the motor off, which is okay. It's an airplane, it's 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 gonna keep flying, um, but you'll hear it, it's in hold mode. You know you didn't get a flap change. Mode. Flip it back off and go right back to flying. So uh, those are the radio setups here and how I have them set up. Uh, go into custom voice setups uh, and do that. Go into dual rates and expos and set that up. Now, one last thing that I haven't set up, so I have the telemetry wire run inside of the battery. I, I'm using the AR8010 Spectrum receiver. So that that receiver has a two prong plug that runs a, a wire up to taps into the battery leads. I have not activated the telemetry. So we'll do that now. We'll click telemetry. I always do this last so I don't have to listen to this while I'm programming the model. because It gets pretty annoying, but so auto config, you can see it says there configuring. Um, and then we're gonna go down to volts. So volts is on two. And then we're gonna double click on volts. And this is, we're gonna fly this in 4S initially. I'm, I'm feeling I'm gonna move to 6S, but we're gonna go to 4S initially. And we're gonna give ourselves status report. Flight pack, 16.3 volts. 16.3 volts, okay, and so now, 16.3 when I initially set up a model and I initially fly it, I get status reports every 60 seconds. Now I can speak that I had a motor start to burn up on one of my other airplanes. I started to hear a funny noise coming from the model. It got louder than normal. But what really got my attention was the voltage dropped on the battery more than I would have expected on the second minute of flying and I and I knew like something's wrong and I came around and I landed and the the motor was burning up and I the uh, the bearing was bad flaps up flaps up so uh the bearing was bad in the electric motor and how I caught it was the voltage every 60 seconds now eventually what I'll do is I'll migrate to probably 15 volts I will migrate to uh, 15 volt alarm. Flight pack, 16.3 volts. I will migrate to, well, this is a 4SO12, so I'll probably, I'll do 13.8. Okay, so I'll take out the status report every 60 seconds. Once I've flown this thing a bit and I trust the engine and I trust the speed control and everything settles down and I've got, you know, some flights on it. I'll take the 60 second status report out and I'll just fly it to the point I want to fly the battery pack down to. I'll get that one alarm and I'll come in and I'll land. So this thing isn't, you know, constantly talking while you're out on the field. But when you're flying the thing for the first 
10 flights, I'd recommend doing status reports every 30 to 60 seconds, just so you can keep an eye on how fast the battery is running down. In case you have, a, you know, in my case, I had a mechanical failure of a bearing, and it was this that figured that out. Now, if I hadn't paid attention or I hadn't set this up, uh, that motor probably would have died in flight, and I probably would have not been able to get back to the field and crashed that airplane. But instead, this thing let me know, hey, your battery's lower than normal. I came back, I landed, and I discovered the mechanical problem. So definitely well worth it. I, I like the feedback, uh, and it has served Flight me well. So that having been said, let's take a look inside the model, take a look at the finished product. Uh, we're gonna disconnect this battery now. Should get a status alarm in a minute. We disconnect it. No, it's not, it's not in. Okay, so there we go. Uh, turn the radio off. Let's, so this is how the wing comes off. You take these nylon screws out. Uh, take them out of there set them down and now this is the setup that I have uh, it's nice because it's pretty much one-handed um, this is a JR unit where all four servos go through one so you can see I can even do that one-handed now just keep in mind if you want to separate the wing spars you are still going to have to keep uh, these where you can get to them because you're going to have to separate them to take the wing apart which is what you're going to want to do while you're moving it so basically you would store it with the wings apart and then you would put it together at the field and keep it that way but uh, let's take a look inside see the finished product here so there is our uh, Spectrum AR8010 receiver. You can see uh, our telemetry wire here, which runs around underneath the decking and then comes up the cable. And I tapped it in right here to the main battery lead. Um, we've got our steering servo. Remember, I set this up a little differently. They had uh, engine, aileron, rudder and then the rudder doing both the steering and the rudder so i separated them out because it's electric if you're going to go electric i would recommend doing it this way so this is the steering wheel now this is the rudder and then this is the elevator uh, there's the 8010 down in there here is the other piece of our harness so uh, now taking the wing on and off is as easy as one clip separating the wing is just two more so now when you get to the field all you have to do is put the wing spars together clip the two connect the two servo plugs and then put the wing on top of the airplane connect it here put it down put the two nylon bolts in and plug the battery in and it's good to go um, Put some decals on it, uh, ironed, no issues ironing out. I thought everything came out really well. Uh, I wanna say it took me fi about 15, 20 minutes to uh, get any of the wrinkles that were on that came in uh, shipping. Uh, I went ahead and, uh, you know, because we're doing electric here, we're not gonna need the on off switch. So just went and took a piece of black sticker and, and covered that up. And uh, that's pretty much it. It's all ready to go. The only other thing I've got to do is balance this prop. So I'll take this off of here and, uh, and balance this prop. But uh, those are the radio settings. Um, oh, yeah, here's the other thing I wanted to show you. These are the parts that you don't need if you're doing electric. So this is the motor mount. And this hole right here is where this steering arm would go up in, right through there. Um, so I guess it doesn't really provide any kind of structural support because it's definitely a lot larger than uh, the steering arm. So cutting it off was probably the right move. Um, but you won't need this if you're doing the electric model uh, and you won't need these. These are motor mounts. Oh, and there's that little rubber piece I was missing. 
you will need every single piece in the kit. I would recommend slicing it open like this and pouring it right into a plastic container with a top on it so you don't lose anything. I managed to lose one little bead for the servo quick connect, um, but I just wound up supplementing in uh, a metal clevis, which was a bit of a pain. Uh, as you've seen, when uh, we originally went to do the equipment test on it, I actually had a bad servo. And uh, I plugged this servo into another receiver, and sure enough, th this is a bad servo. Brand new, right out of the box, uh, bad servo. But we swapped it out. It's all good to go. Uh, the airplane is ready to fly now. Unfortunately, uh, I can't fly for at least two weeks. So I chose to do this video without a flight video. So keep an eye out for flight videos. Um, they recommended a 3200 4S. Uh, I have a 35, this is a 37. I think, you know, I mean, just based on this tray and, and the dimensions of this airplane, I don't think it's gonna have any problem hauling a 6S around. Um, I went with an 80 amp speed control and this uh, this motor recommended a 60, and I I just I, I think this this will be fine with a 6s. I might limit the throttle to say oh, and I did limit the throttle and the throttle curve to 90% for the initial couple flights. I don't run it at 100%. Um, maybe when I do the 6s, I'll start off running it at like 80% and see how the motor holds up. Um, I think it's going to be fine with 6S, uh, but keep an, keep an eye out for uh, future flight videos, and hopefully I'll put this thing through a battery of tests with uh, a bunch of different batteries. So there it is. The Great Plains Avastar Elite Electric Build, all complete, uh, pretty much ready for... Uh, I like to do two flights. I like to do a trim flight and a maiden flight. Um... You know, I see so many guys that are so excited about their maiden flight. And, and in the meantime, the airplane needs to be trimmed and it needs mechanical adjustments. I like to separate the two. I like to do a mechanical trim flight. The sole purpose is take it up, fly it around the pattern, get it all trimmed out, get it mechanically adjusted if it needs it, bring it down on the ground, play with it, maybe do a real short trim flight again, then put a full battery pack in it and go out and do a maiden flight with a plane that's actually trimmed out and ready to fly. So keep an eye out for the uh, maintenance flight or, or the, the trim flight. Uh, I, I may or may not post it. I don't always post those, but uh, it, it, I will 100% be posting the maiden flight and putting this thing around the pattern. I'm really anxious to see how this uh, these ailerons perform based against this wing size. I've got uh, another aircraft that has a much smaller wing and has larger ailerons. So I can't wait to see how it handles when I get batteries in it and get it in the air.